Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 211, featuring the first of a new series of interviews with Mr. Dave Gilbert, the founder of Wadget Eye. Now this is a company that specializes in those good old classic point-and-click adventure games. So if you're a fan of uh, games like The Secret of Monkey Island, and Gabriel Knight, and King's Quest, you're definitely going to be interested in this guy and his games. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Gilbert. All right, folks, I am here with the great Dave Gilbert, the president of Wadget Eye Games, a great. company. <laughs> yeah, you're great. Uh, you founded Thank it back you. in uh, 2006. You've probably heard of some of these games, right? Gemini Roo, uh, the Shiva, and uh, many, many more. Uh, Dave, how are you doing today? I am doing really good. I'm doing really good. Thanks. So I noticed uh, I was reading some of your other interviews, and it said that you had basically got started in game development around uh, 2011, specifically after the 9-11 uh, tragedy, and you got into game development as a way to take your mind off things. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that connection a little bit more. Oh, sure. Um, well, I, it was uh, 2001, September. I live in New York. So, uh, yeah, I was here when that happened. We actually almost uh, saw it happen. I didn't see them fall, but I did see them on fire, and it was a very traumatic time wow. for me and my family and anyone who lived here, uh, obviously. And uh, I had been laid off from this really crappy office job a few months before, so I didn't have a job, and I just really wanted to get my mind off things, and I discovered Adventure Game Studio, which is this uh, third-party freeware engine that uh, – allows you to create old school adventure games. And being a fan of those games, I gave it a try. And I wrote a very small game called The Repossessor. And um, I uploaded it, wrote it in like a weekend, uploaded it to the forum. I'm like, hi guys, here's my game. And people seemed to like it, so I kept writing more. And then in 2006, I again found myself in a situation where I was not working, but uh, I had money saved up, and I figured it was now or never, so I just dived right in. I always joke that I was doing it as a way to put off getting a real job, and I am still kind of doing that. Okay, so one of those jobs you had was teaching English in Korea. You know, How in the world did you end up, end up there doing that? I was working in the garment center, and it was fine. You know, I made uh, decent money, but it wasn't really what I really wanted to do. I was uh, um, kind of looking uh, for ways to get out of it and get into something else, and I just didn't know what. And uh, some friends of mine had done the English teaching in Korea thing, so I thought, oh, you know what, maybe this is something I could do just as a way to shake things up. And I applied, and I got in, so I just moved over there and did it. It was my understanding there's a huge video game scene there, especially uh, StarCraft. Oh, man, it's insane. I mean, they have like three or four television networks dedicated to um, video games. I mean, it's like pro sports over there. It's like they're like decked out in, in corporation logos, and they look like rock stars. It's, it's pretty awesome. I didn't couldn't really get involved because I, don't, I couldn't understand Korean, and I never played StarCraft, so I couldn't really follow it, but it's pretty wild. Do you have any personal theories about why they – you know why video gaming is so huge there? I I really can't. I, I really don't. Um, I mean, no. I'm sorry to say. I don't know if you want to edit that out so I don't sound like a video <laughs> idiot. But uh, I really don't. I mean, I, I know what I thought was interesting when I was there was that uh, I'd go to these uh, cyber cafes. And because they were really, really cheap. It was like a dollar for the – you could spend the entire day there. It was unbelievable. And uh, – you could, there were all these kids playing these um, multiplayer games like StarCraft or, or Kart Racer or any of those games. And they were just like all talking to each other and they were all like working together and like chatting across the room and they were having so much fun. And what really impressed me was that it was, um, it was this actual social thing. They weren't just in their bedrooms alone in a dark room. They actually went out to meet their friends to play these games. And I thought that was an interesting cultural uh, difference between like the stereotypical gamer nerd here in the West versus versus there where they actually hang out physically together to play games. I thought that was very nice. So do you consider yourself to be more of that traditional? <laughs> I don't play many indoor gamer games, sadly. Um, I just uh, I just like games to end eventually and I can move on to something else in my life. Uh, I just can't get that obsessed with something for that amount of time. So I'm not the world's most social gamer now. 
I did see one interesting thing in a, one of your interviews that apparently you're a big fan of Doctor Who soundtracks. <laughs> I am, but uh, I mean, that's funny. That you have a, a particular doctor that you, and there is a correct answer to this question. There is a correct, for everyone, favorite, there's a correct answer. A favorite doctor. Do I have a favorite? <laughs> I mean, I, it's hard to say because I, uh, for a long time I would have said Peter Davison, but I watch those old ones now and they put me to sleep. It's just the pacing so slow compared to the new ones. But um, I mean, I, I love each one for different reasons. That's all I can say. I mean, I really like the manicness of, uh, of Matt Smith. I love the um, just the intensity of David Tennant. I love the toughness of Chris Eccleston. I like them all. I'm looking forward to seeing what the next one has uh, in store. But yeah, I love the music. Love it. Okay, so you're obviously uh, owe a lot of your success to Adventure Game Studio, right? The Definitely. AGS. I was wondering, you know, first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about that package for people that may not be familiar with it, and then uh, why you chose to use that. Uh, well, Adventure Game Studio, like I said before, is a, you call it a third-party engine tool uh, that takes a lot of the grunt work out of making games like this. Uh, you can you know, import animations and attach a character to it, put that character against a background, set up hot spots and walkable areas and things like that. It can do a lot more, but that's it can takes a lot of the core grunt work out of the process. And that uh, sort of answers your second question, and that's why... I use it. There's really no other comparable tool out there. There are some, uh, but the learning curve to use them is much, much higher. AGS is so much easier to just pick up and start using and get the basics of a game working right away. And with time and with practice, you can do a lot more complicated things with it, uh, which is why I like it. And I sometimes think of switching to another engine because there are some limitations to AGS uh, but it's just, I'm so used to AGS that I just keep returning to it, like Stockholm Syndrome, like, I'll just, all right, I'll, I'll just keep <laughs> using you, because uh, it's just so easy to use. I can just pick up and I know exactly how to make what's in my head, versus having to learn a whole new tool and then make the game. So for now, I'm sticking with AGS, uh, despite some of its shortcomings. That's primarily designed for 2D Adventure games? Yeah, exactly. So you still have to get in there and make all your own graphics and everything, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for it basically is a tool that sets out to do exactly this. And if that is what you want to make, there's really nothing better. 2D old school adventure game, I mean, it does exactly that. It has everything in place for you to do exactly that, which is why I use it. Now, I saw where you were having some trouble with the trouble with it. You didn't like, uh, you know, the lack of portability options. For mm -hmm. it, and uh, apparently it's kind of relies on this sort of uh, defunct direct draw mode. Um, it has direct draw and direct 3D, and uh, it's the, the issue with it, and it's no one's fault really. The the guy who developed the engine, his name is Chris Jones. He started working on it, I think, way back in 1999. Uh, I think it was called Adventure Creator back then. Uh, I didn't start using it until 2001, but. He uh, back then no one really thought about portability. It was uh, you know PC or nothing really. There wasn't a lot of Mac games back then. Uh, so he made this engine specifically for PC, and over time he just enhanced this one engine until it was just this big behemoth of a thing. And now uh, it's just it, the games. The engine was never made to be portable in the first place, so it's very difficult to do it. We are working on it right now. Uh, he stopped working on the engine several years ago, and so it's he made it open source. But it's so complicated, and there's so many... I don't know anything about the programming end of it, um, but there have been some strides to uh, make it more open source. I know there's a Linux version, which kind of works. There's a, a iOS port, which we just took advantage of and released Gemini Roo on, uh, on iOS. And we are trying to get a Mac version um, up and running uh, of Gemini Roo. It's slow because, like we said, the engine was never designed for this, but we're getting there. I'm a little curious. I know you've probably been asked this a hundred times, you know, why point-and-click adventure games? And I really, though, I think most of the audience for this show will understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we love these games, right? I know you're a big fan of uh, Gabriel Knight, uh, which I don't, you know, that, that series doesn't seem to get a lot of uh, the attention I think it deserves. You know, most people talk about Monkey Island and uh, Grim Fandango. So I wonder if you just kind of talk about Gabriel Knight a little bit. Uh, well, I admit, I 
I'm ashamed to admit, um, earlier this year, my wife and I went to New Orleans and we replayed uh, the first Gabriel Knight because my wife had never played it and we wanted to see New Orleans through the game. And um, I'm probably going to lose some fans because of this, but the game hasn't aged that well. Uh, I think just there are a lot of design, just the way games were back then. Uh, a lot of the first half of the game is just going through puzzles because that's what's in front of you versus giving you a real motivation or goal as of why you're doing this. Um, I think something like Monkey Islands, I mean, funny is funny. I mean, it's it's just very funny and very clever and very uh, fantastical. Um, and it's it's got a more broad appeal, I guess, than something like Gabriel Knight, uh, which is why people always go back to Gabriel, uh, to Monkey Island as being like their favorite game or the most memorable. Um, but I think the great thing about Gabriel Knight, and what I always stuck with me about it, uh, is the fusion of real world history and the supernatural, um, especially number two, the second one, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the uh, Prince Ludwig of Bavaria being a werewolf sounds ridiculous on paper, but play the game and you could believe it happened. Uh, it's just, it, it's set up so perfectly. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with Blackwell, um, where there's a lot of New York uh, characters and history intertwined with uh, with the stories in the game. Uh, there's this, this interesting um, uh, reporter named Joseph Mitchell who I just learned his history and ha there was such interesting uh, mystery around him that I just had to do something with it and so I did. I always say that I found my, uh, my Ludwig where I, I learned about him and I'm like I gotta do something with this and I did. I was gonna say with the uh, the second Gabriel Knight game, you single that one out again. You know, I noticed you did that in the other interview too. And that's one. Of, that's probably my favorite of the series. Uh, but I like it probably for a unique reason, and that's that you know at one point of the game you go into this sort of old German tavern, mm -hmm. this little pub, and you've got a uh, you know all these wonderful pints that you can just sit there and pull pint after pint of ale. I don't remember that scene. Is that his, <laughs> uh, probably because I drank too much. Um, were you Gabriel or Grace during that scene? I don't remember. I think you're Gabriel. I'm pretty Wait, sure. Is it the the, lodge, the hunting lodge. Yeah, the hunting lodge. Yes, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any game with an L tap can't be all bad. Is my motto. So let's uh, shoot forward, I guess, to 2006 when you found uh, uh, Wajidai. Mm -hmm. And you know, first of all, the name Wajidai <laughs> and the logo apparently has something to do with uh, ancient Egypt. So I wonder if yeah. you could elaborate on that a bit. Well, when I was, uh, I, uh, yeah, the name probably. If I could go back in time and change one thing. I, it would be the name of the company because it's just not, it's hard to spell. People always spell it with a G and drive me crazy. Um, hard to pronounce. It's not very memorable. Uh, I honestly did not expect to still be in business all this time, um, but here I am. Uh, but I chose it because I used to really be into Egypt, uh, Egyptology and reading all the myths and things like that. And I always liked the symbol of the Wajidai, just the way it looks. I just thought, I just thought it was, thought it was a neat image. And when I was a teenager, I always said, okay, if I ever needed a logo for anything, I will use the Wajidai. And then when I uh, was going to release the first Blackwell game, I needed a company name because uh, I wanted to make a website and I needed a company name and I just couldn't think of anything. And I'm, I'm sitting there at the web domain the registration page going, all right, what do I, what do I call this company? And I'm like, well, I know the logo is going to be the Wajidai, so whatever, Wajidai game's done. Uh, and here I am seven, eight years later and... Um, People are asking me, wait, how do you spell that? And I'm like, oh, damn it. Why did I choose that name? So that's the story uh, behind the name. Um, I just like the Wajidai. I just think it's cool. So what would you rather have as the name? I don't know. <laughs> At this point, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, I still don't know. I guess that's the problem. I still don't know what I'd call myself. So, yeah. All right, anyway, so it seems like the first game that really put you on the map was uh, the Shiva. Mm-hmm. Uh, which stars a, a rabbi yeah. as the main character. And I don't know of any other game that you could say that about. <laughs> a very un you know, in the you know, I was looking more into the themes of the game and how they uh, there's sort of uh, a lot of uh, religious connections to the the gameplay, you know, built into the decisions that you make along the way. Sort of. I was wondering, what, you know, what what kind of a well, so that <laughs> maybe you you should describe the game. You probably do a much better <laughs> job than that. And then sort of uh, what led you to that concept. Well, I, I wrote that game just after I got back from uh, Korea. 
which makes me sound like some grizzled veteran. I just got back from Korea. <laughs> I came back from teaching from in uh, Korea. And uh, my time there was was interesting because I, I am Jewish and growing up and have lived in living in New York for so long, I was always surrounded by other Jewish people. And being in Korea was the first time I wasn't surrounded by Jewish people. Uh, it seemed a lot of people didn't know uh, what what it meant, what it was like to be Jewish. Um, things that I never would have heard in New York. Like there was this one time I was in a restaurant and I was with my other uh, English teachers who were also from the West. And one of them said, wow, they really, they really do this on the, on, on the sauce here. And I was like, wow, like I never heard that before. You wouldn't say that in New York for sure. And things like that, like uh, a lot of the Koreans I met, they no idea what Judaism was. And it was the first time I was really acutely aware of being Jewish. And here I never gave it a second thought. And when I got back and I had the itch to make a game, I kind of decided to make something to reconnect with that part of myself. And so the Shiva was was kind of my answer for that. And the game is basically about a, a rabbi whose congregation is dwindling fast. And uh, he gets a... Um, a man has died. A former member of his congregation had died and left him money, and he doesn't know why. So he decides to pay a shiva call, hence the name, and uh, look into – try to find out who he was, what happened to him, why he left him this money. So you wouldn't say there's – you know, there's not a effort in the game to make the player more religious or more, uh, more no. of a moral – I'm not really that religious myself, so – uh, I kind of just toyed with a bunch of questions that have always been in my head and a lot of other Jews today, like, what does it mean to be Jewish? Um, can you be, can you turn your back on it? Are you Jewish no matter what? I mean, what, like, just things like that. I had no desire to convert anybody or uh, anything like that. I just wanted to tell a story and write a game, and that's what I did. Is it intended for Jewish gamers, or is it something that anybody could... Um, no, no background. Not really, experience I, I just, required. yeah. At the time, I was, I didn't even intend to sell it. It was originally going to be a freeware game, and uh, I just made it. I didn't really think about any of that stuff, and uh, that's sort of a lesson that I had to relearn over time. Is that uh, it's best just to make the game you want to play, and not think about will this sell? Is this commercially viable? And that kind of thing. And um, uh, people always seem to come back to the shiva as being this really intellectual important thing and i really had no no deep thoughts going into making it i just wanted to tell this particular story and i did and it seemed to resonate with people so i definitely got a lot of attention i was a uh, what was the mags the uh, monthly one month ags game contest apparently it, it, i guess it won right yeah that's the that's what i made the game for originally so i made the game in one month uh so i made the game for that and then i just had so much fun doing it i decided to add the voice acting and I sold it. So I was reading in one interview where you talked about uh, what you called indie guilt. <laughs> that was a long time ago. I don't over feel that this anymore. decision. So <laughs> I mean, what was the problem? Why'd you feel bad to begin with? Uh, well, at the time, I mean, the indie scene it was just sort of starting, but it wasn't as big as it is now. Uh, I'd come from a freeware uh, community. Uh, not many people had sold AGS games before. Very, very few. I think two that I can think of at the time. And so me selling it felt like kind of a, a cop out. Like, why are you selling this game? You know, all these, you know, this game, you know, what makes this game so special? Which is why I added the voice acting. I added a commentary track. That's how that started. And um, it was just sort of this sense that these games were meant to be free and I shouldn't be charging people for them, even though I only charged five bucks. And then, um, but I realized fast that I wanted to, I wanted to see if I could earn my living from this. So I couldn't give away the game for free. So I discontinued the freeware version and only made the commercial version available. So that was that. So there was a bit of guilt there, but not for very long. <laughs> so I have a question from the RPG Codex about the game. And that's, uh, are you doing a sequel uh, to the Shiva? Or right. do you have any plans to do one? So you, uh, just out of curiosity, you asked the RPG Codex if they had any questions for me? Well, I just posted it on Twitter and they responded. Oh, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> it's am a... I going to do a sequel? Probably not, although we are doing a uh, remake of it. We are uh, releasing it for iOS right now, but the way the original graphics were, 
they were way the, the, the screens were way too small. But on a big computer screen, it was no big deal. But on a phone, it'd be impossible to see. So we're redoing a lot of the graphics and making it more touch screen friendly. So that's going to look um, very, very different when when that's finished. And that should hopefully be done soon. So no sequels planned. I just uh, I. A long time ago, I had some ideas for a sequel, but I realized that I was just doing it because there seemed to be a demand for it and not because I had anything really stellar in mind. And that's never a good reason to make anything. So I never, never really did it. I think the story is is pretty much solid. You know, you know it almost sounds like you weren't expecting the success that you had with the show. Um, I wouldn't even call it that successful. I mean, it was it was enough to pay my groceries uh, for several months and the occasional night out and I could barely squeak my bills as well. Um, it certainly got me a lot of attention from press. Uh, it got me a, um, GDC choice award nomination, which was awesome. And for best new studio, which I didn't win and not something I could be nominated for a second time. But, uh, um, it got me a lot of attention making me realize that, Hey, maybe there's something to this. But I wouldn't say it got a lot of sales. I think that the graphic style put a lot of people off. Um, the fact that it was it was it was very short, very simple. You could finish it in very little time, uh, and that put a lot of people off. And so I think um, also I priced it really really cheaply because of that. So it wasn't really a lot to sustain me for a very long time. Uh, I think it's probably my least selling game of all. Uh, in terms of pure profit made. Uh, Steam didn't want to take it. Um, hopefully that's going to change. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it was successful in terms of sales, but it made a big splash in the media at the time, at least by my standards. So that's sort of what kept me going. Well, what was the, the splash in the media? Why were they drawing so much attention to it? I think mostly because of the premise. They were just interested in a, a game starring a rabbi. And uh, it was really funny because it got a little bit of negative attention too. There was some uh, Israeli rabbi was interviewed about the game. And he's like, yeah, you know, like rabbis don't act like this. They don't go around like swearing and cursing and, and doing all these things. And I'm like, the rabbi in the game never does any of those things. <laughs> so I don't think he played it or, or knew anything about it. Um, I think the the premise of a video game starring a rabbi was unique enough that it got some attention. And I did kind of ride off of that with Blackwell and everything that followed. Um, but I've never really revisited the premise with the character or, or anything. I I really don't know where to go with it. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Dave Gilbert. A lot of great stuff coming up, including his Blackwell series, Gemini Roo, and much, much more. So please stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. And a reminder, too, that I've started this new website called matchhat.us. A lot of great stuff going on there. There's forums and blog posts, soon to be uh, more audio podcasts, and all sorts of uh, related things to the show. So if you like the show, head over to matchat.us uh, match and check it out. And uh, while you're there, don't forget to support the show with a uh, subscription or one-time donation. Really appreciate it, guys. It means a lot. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I've got something very, very special indeed. Uh, this is a Woot Stout, a Stone Farking Wheaton uh, collaboration ale. It's uh, brewed in conjunction with the Stone Company. They do the Levitation Ale, the Arrogant Bastard. And apparently, this is a... Uh, Brewed by, uh, in collaboration with Will Wheaton from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation and the uh, Big Bang Theory. It's uh, ale brewed with pecans, wheat and rye, one quarter aged in bourbon barrels. And it's 13% uh, alcohol by volume. And there's quite a bit of a, quite a write up on the back of the bottle. I'm not going to spoil the story for you, but uh, if you like ale and <laughs> Will Wheaton, you probably definitely want to be looking for this one. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of Will Wheaton's uh, Woot Stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. i got to say, this is uh, definitely a potent concoction. Uh, there's an aroma coming off of this. You can definitely smell that bourbon they were talking about. Very sort of smoky uh, aroma to it. 
you can almost smell some vapors coming <laughs> coming off of this. I think this is going to be very, very powerful indeed. I think I better taste this before I pass out from the fumes alone. Um, this is a, a quite a bitter, a bitter brew here. Very dark, sort of a dark cherry, uh, kind of a cough syrup-like flavor to it. You can definitely taste the bourbon. Almost tasted like I was just uh, drinking some bourbon just then. <laughs> uh, quite powerful stuff. Uh, Taste-wise, uh, let me just give it one more taste here. I've got to say, this is a, just a really... <coughs> Makes you want to cough, it's so powerful. Uh, this is definitely something a beer that you would want to sip on. Maybe pour it into one of those uh, brandy sifter kind of glasses and just sort of slowly enjoy that over the course of uh, an evening. Uh, you know, not definitely not something you would want to quaff. Uh, Flavor-wise, um, it's good if you want something dark, sort of a sweet, dark, and uh, really bitter. Uh, if that taste, if that fish your taste profile, uh, you really enjoy this. If you're looking for something more refreshing, though, I would definitely uh, pass over this one. I guess I'll go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this one. It is uh, quite tasty, but just know what you're getting into with this. Very strong, very powerful. Uh, definitely not a child's brew. So I was looking for a good quotation to win the show, and I was looking at some Jewish proverbs that I was really enjoying. And I found uh, this one, uh, this particular one that I think is very fitting uh, for you guys. And it goes something like this. And it goes something like this. When a habit begins to cost money, it's called a hobby. See you guys next week. The peasants feel you have no regard for them. What? I have no regard for the peasants. They are my people. I am their sovereign. I love them. Pull! Drifting to the left.